We come into the house of the Lord under the authority of the word of the Lord with the people of the Lord to worship him. Let's commemorate this time. Let's remember the Lord and his sacrifice. Sing this hymn at the cross. blessing to know that it was at that cross that we can declare because of our freedom, because of our victory, because of what he has provided for us on the cross, we can declare we are happy all the day solely because of the power of the cross. Let's sing this hymn together. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. look into the face of the Lord.
daylight flees. Would you be seated where you are, please? In St. Louis, there's a plethora of churches. One of the constant things that we kept hearing was new church. Why do we need a new church in this community? We already got a bunch of them not doing nothing. In this neighborhood, I mean, there is a lot of homelessness, prostitution, fatherless homes. The world has changed. Sin has increased, there's more crime, there's more drugs are prevalent. It's not a secret thing anymore. My family and I bought a house in the community and we moved there in the community. So the people that, that we wanted to reach, we were living amongst. We would set up um, on a Sunday, bring our own church, bring a barbecue pig, some chips, some hot dogs, and we would have worship service in the neighborhood park. And we just began to live there, love there, serve there, and people started to come. When we see people submitting to discipleship relationships, when we see people surrender their heart to Jesus, when we begin to see the neighborhood beginning to change around us, like that's when we just know like, like we're, we're doing this right and we wouldn't change it for the world. But it's gonna take all of us working together to ensure that, that, that lostness is being addressed in our communities. It's the body of Christ. There's someone in Tennessee, they may never come to the inner city of St. Louis, but they can give and contribute because they believe in what we're doing as a body, as an entity to help us to get to that next level. We just gotta work together. We can do more together than we can do apart. We can do more together than apart, and that is a message that ought to ring true in all of our hearts. And I am grateful for people like Michael and Tracy Bird, who grew up in inner city St. Louis, moved away, but God called them back to where they grew up to reach a community that desperately needs the gospel. And because of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, you and I are able to help and to take part in that work that's being done in St. Louis, but also work that's being done through church plants all over North America. And we're able to be a part of it here 
from First Baptist Church of Ellisville. Last week, we introduced to you kind of the goals for this year. I remember last year, our goal was $5,000. We raised $16,000. So we decided to up it a little bit this year. We're gonna, our goal this year is $10,000. And we want to, to give faithfully and sacrificially to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And you can do that throughout the month. There are offering envelopes at our tables, but you can also do that online. Just like you, if you give online already, there's an option to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Offering. But there's a couple of ways that we want to pray specifically this morning, particularly as the birds have requested us to pray for them. They want to, we want to pray that they would have wisdom in creatively reaching their neighbors. It's very important to be able to find the needs that are there that are unique to that particular area and meeting those needs. But also we want to pray that God will open hearts to the gospel and use Faith Community Church there in St. Louis for his glory and for his honor. And so as we begin to prepare ourselves for worship this morning, we want to pray for the birds and also Faith Community Bible Church this morning. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come before you upon the throne of grace. And Lord, we can come with confidence because of what Jesus has accomplished for us, not on our own merits, but solely because of what Jesus has done. And God, this morning, we want to pray specifically for the birds. God, as they are trying to reach a particular area that you have called them to. And Father, I am so grateful, Lord, that when you call us to do something, you equip us to do that. And God, this day you are continually equipping them. But Lord, you've also invited us to be a part of the gospel enterprise. And God, even from our seats here in Ellisville, Mississippi, we are able to take part in ministry that's so much larger than us, so much bigger than us. And God, we thank you for that opportunity to do that. Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, that you would give them wisdom to, of how to reach their community in a more creative way. God, that you give them people and gifts and talents to surround them with, Lord, so that they can reach uh, that group that, Lord, you've called them to. But, Lord, we pray for that church. Father, we pray for their hearts. Father, we pray for their souls. God, we pray for, for quality over quantity, Lord. We pray, Lord, for a mighty movement to take place in that Bible-believing church. But, God, this morning we also pray the same things for us here. God, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the wisdom of how to reach our neighborhood better. Father, that you give us the courage to open our mouths when, we, when our mouths need to be open, Lord, to share the good news, Lord, of the people that you've placed in front of us. God, this morning as we gather to worship, Lord, we know the scripture tells us where two or more are gathered, you are there. And Lord, we know that you are here this morning. God, I pray for that one that's here this morning that may not know you as their Savior and their Lord. God, I pray that you would draw them to yourself this morning. Father, for those of us who are believers, Lord, that you'd call us to you. Father, that you would show us things in our life, Lord, that we need to repent of. Things, Lord, that we need to sacrifice on the altars this morning. God, whatever it may be, may we be sensitive to your spirit. And God, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you just remain seated for a moment? Just consider the sacrifice the Lord has made for you, for us. Be grateful. Thank the Lord this morning. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running. was far too wide, but from the far side of the castle, you had me in your sight, so you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside, there at the cross. Let's stand together. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I be grateful. Hope. Thank you for the cross. Thank you. Amen. 
sing to him. You took my place. the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We can de declare glory from a position of freedom, from a position of salvation, from a position of redemption. God, I praise you that we can glorify him because of what he accomplished on that tree, on that old rugged cross for me, for us. God, I pray that you would work through his sacrifice, even this morning, to sanctify your, your children and to draw those who don't belong to you to the sanctifying salvation of Christ. And I pray that you'd do that for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You could and probably will agree with me when I say that the invention of the cell phone has made more things and more things are now caught on camera than ever before. Amen? You have to be really careful about that today. We see natural disasters. We see people escaping death by the skin of their teeth. We see reactions of real people played out in real time. And, and if you're not careful... You can get sucked down on social media, that rabbit hole of watching videos, and you can look up, and it's been two hours. You've been sitting there, and the reason why you stopped is because your cell phone's about to die, right? None of y'all want to admit it. The altars will be open at the end of the service today for you guys to come and to repent. 
But we know that you can get sucked down that rabbit hole. But somebody always seems to be at the right place at the right time to capture those things on video, right? So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about right now, this very moment where we are. It is 1051 a.m. Right now, in this very moment, do you believe this morning that God has brought you here for a purpose? Amen. Good, good, that he's brought you here for a purpose. Because here's the reality, you are here. We, we are meeting with God's people. We are singing songs of worship. We are singing songs of adoration. The word of God is opened. There are many things we know that compete for our allegiance, don't they? But there is only one true God who woes the hearts of his people. Do you believe this morning? Do you believe that the God of the universe desires to have a personal relationship with you? Maybe he brought you here to show you that this relationship isn't about, about religion, but it is, it's not about involving and observing rituals and, and keeping rules, but it's real and it's alive this morning. Today, Palm Sunday, we begin to turn our eyes towards Easter to begin thinking about what's called the Passion Week and all the things that have gone on and will go on. And we begin to focus on the significance of the week, but we, we focus on the cross, we focus on the tomb, we focus, about, focus on the resurrection, all of those things that are ahead. And so we come to the Bible in John chapter 20. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me there to John chapter 20 this morning. And in the just this first 10 verses of John chapter 20, we see this resurrection story beginning to take a life of its own. John writes in John chapter 20 verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one whom Jesus loved, and that's, that's John, that's the disciple that he's talking about there, said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb. That was John's way of saying that he ran the 40 faster than Peter did. Okay, that's what he's saying there. In verse 5, and stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by himself. That's how you know that Jesus was God, because he folded his clothes, right? <laughs> verse 8. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, that's John's way of saying, hmm, I'm still faster than that guy. But here's the crux, you ready? Also went in him. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes and so we see in this just little small snapshot here, we see John and Peter running to the tomb. And as they run to the tomb, they find the tomb is empty. And John walks in and the Bible says that he saw it and he believed. Well, what did he see? Well, actually, he really didn't see anything, but he saw the face cloth that was around Jesus lying there folded up. And at that very juncture, absence spoke more than presence in that very moment. And what I want us to see this morning is I want us to see what they saw. They saw an empty tomb, and I want you to believe just as they believed. And so I want to talk to you about the echoes from the empty tomb. And we've all stood in places where we could shout and the sound of our voices bounce off a, a flat wall or a mountain. And we hear that voice or that sound repeated back to us. Scientists tell us that echoes uh, basically are sound waves that bounce back from a hard, smooth surface. 
And when we do that, we all expect a natural echo to repeat exactly what we say. But the echoes that we hear from the tomb are a supernatural echo. It is a miraculous echo that we see here. It doesn't always echo back what it hears. For instance, I want us to look this morning at four words that still echo from the empty tomb. Here's the first word. Some shout hate, but the tomb echoes love. Some shout hate, but the tomb echoes love. It's hard for us to imagine, to imagine the hatred that was directed towards Jesus on the day he was crucified. He was in the hands of what the scripture calls wicked men. He was beaten. He was tortured. The Bible says that these men spit on him and they plucked the beards, uh, the hairs from the beard on his face. They slammed a, a crown of thorns into his scalp. They used the cat of nine tails, which is a whip with all types of trash in it, basically that would slash your flesh on his back. To Basically, he was a mass of bleeding tissue at that point. They drove what would be considered like a railroad spike into his hands and his feet. Every action shouted, we hate you. But every reaction demonstrated by Jesus was love. When Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, this is what he said. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Here's one thing that I have discovered in life. It is hard to hate somebody that you're praying for, right? It's hard to hate them if you're actually praying for them. Now, Jesus wasn't surprised by the hostility here. The hostility that he faced on the cross was real. He expected it, but he also responded in love. John chapter 15 early on tells us that this is what Jesus said. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And then he goes on to say, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And when you've been touched by God's love, you no longer have any room in your heart for hatred. Which if there is hate, you listening? You ready? If there is hate, that should tell you something about your heart. The world shouts hate. But the cross, the empty tomb, the tomb echoes love in return. The message of Easter is that God can turn hatred into love. They nailed Jesus to a cross and they put him to death for treason and, and for blasphemy. He stretched out his arms and in doing so, he embraces you and me in a gesture that tells us very much about the love of God. Some shout hate, but the tomb echoes love. But second of all, some shout failure, but the tomb echoes forgiven. From an earthly standpoint, think about it this way. Jesus would be considered a failure. Why do we know that? He dies at about 33 years of age, without really doing anything that people probably today and even in that culture would consider to be significant in his days. He didn't own a home, didn't have a mortgage. He didn't own a company. He was penniless. He had never written uh, the great novel. He was a teacher, but he never built a school. He was a, a healer, but he, but he never built a hospital or anything. From the world's standpoint, he was a failure. But we know that Jesus came to forgive. When Jesus was on the cross, he spoke those powerful words that we read in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. The original language, the verb tense is there. Literally, it means he kept on saying that. Father, forgive them. Imagine the, the soldier who knelt there to pound those spikes into his hands. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Imagine when they lifted him up on the cross into the sky. He said, Father, forgive them. When they walked by and they insulted him, you know, he said, Father, forgive them. When it comes to keeping God's perfect laws, here's the thing. We're all failures. We're all not good at it. For example, Peter, we use him as an example because he's a good scapegoat here. He was a leader of the disciples. We know that. Scripture tells us that. But on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter deserted Jesus. 
right? He denied him three times that he even knew Jesus, and he must have felt like a complete failure at the end of the day. But Jesus had something for him that would change him forever, and it's the same thing that can change you forever, and that's forgiveness. As a follower of Jesus, we often miss the powerful truth of the tomb. We rightly focus on the cross, we should, and then the resurrection. But we think the burial time is only kind of a three-day waiting period, kind of like applying for a gun permit. It's just a three-day waiting period. But the Bible says something that we have was buried with Jesus, our sins. Baptism is a symbol of this burial and we say buried with him in baptism. We were raised in walk, to walk in the newness of life is what Paul writes in Romans 6, 4. It was our old person, the person we were before we came to Christ who died with Christ and was buried with him. And there's a line from the great old hymn and the Casting Crowns group has discovered it uh, recently and they said, or a few years ago, and this is the words of that hymn, living he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh, glorious day. So some shout failure, but the tomb echoes forgiveness. But thirdly, some shout dead, but the tomb echoes alive. Now, think about it. Towards sundown on the day that Jesus was crucified, here's what happened. The Jewish leaders they didn't want the, the guilty to be hanging on the cross because they wanted things to look pretty and presentable there on the Sabbath day, which started at sunset. And so John chapter 19, verse 31, actually tells us that this just wasn't a, a regular Sabbath day, but this was a special Passover Saturday uh, at this particular point. So at the cross, the Jewish leaders, they wanted the, the guilty killed and, and basically a special Passover so it wouldn't be desecrated. They wanted those, those people off those crosses. So what would happen is that a Roman soldier would come by with a, with a Roman mallet and he would break the lower parts of the legs of those who were hanging on the cross, particularly those two thieves. And when he broke those legs, the guilty could no longer push up and, and to breathe anymore. Therefore, they would, be, they would suffocate very soon. But they slowly moved to Jesus. And when they came to Jesus, they realized that Jesus was, was already gone. And to certify that he was dead, they thrust a spear under his rib cage and, and they pierced the pericardial sac there and the water and the blood began to flow out of his side. You know, it was the, Ro the job of the Roman, Roman soldier there, the centurion, to certify death. It's kind of like a medical examiner does today. And it was official. Jesus was dead. I'm sure the Jewish officials, they wiped their hands and, and they said, he's dead. Problem's gone. Problem solved. I'm sure the, the devil laughed with glee and said, he's dead. But when the world shouts dead, God shouts alive. The Bible says on that Sunday morning, the women arrived at the tomb and they saw an angel. Listen to what they said in Luke 24, verse 5. In the fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Now, this planet, and we've got it all across Jones County. If you ride into rural Jones County, you'll see cemeteries all over the place. And this planet is littered with graves and tombs of millions of people. Some are famous, but... Most of them are tombs of people like you and me, ordinary people. But you see things like the pyramids in Egypt, and they're really tombs. The Taj Mahal is a, in India is kind of a, a mausoleum in, in effect. The Ming Dynasty emperors are buried in massive tombs, and some of those complexes crawling of about 100 acres. You go to the tomb of the religious leaders and religious teachers, of the past and you can call roll you can call the name of Muhammad and you'll hear the words here Buddha here Moses here Confucius here Jesus and there's silence there's silence all we hear is an echo from an empty tomb and even this morning even if you're a skeptic you've got to answer this question 
And you got to be honest about it. What happened to the body of Jesus? Well, from the start, we know through the Bible that the followers of Jesus claimed that he was alive. He wasn't just alive in their memories or just alive in their hearts. They claimed that a bodily resurrection of Jesus had happened. They, they, they claimed that he had, they had seen him with their eyes. They had touched him with their hands. They had heard him with their ears. Now, suppose for just a moment, okay? Suppose for just a moment that this was a lie that they invented. What would have been the purpose of fabricating this kind of story? If they were dishonest enough to promote a hoax, then their motive must have been for personal gain, right? They wanted to get something out of it. So what did they get out of it? What did they gain? Well, let me tell you what they gained. Stephen was stoned to death. James was thrown off the corner of the Temple Mount, and he was stoned after that. Bartholomew was, was skinned alive. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged through the streets and then until he was dead. James was beheaded. Jude was, was shot by arrows. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. John was exiled. Anyone want to sign up for that? Any takers? Not me. Do you think at least one of these liars would have confessed their plot to save their own life? Yeah. But all of them went to their deaths claiming the central truth of the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried after three days, and God raised him from the dead. Every one of them. Now, the latest statistic on death still reads like the old statistic on death, right? One out of one people dies. Death is inevitable. But the bigger question is this. What happens to a person when they die? What happens? Many people insist that this life is all that there is. And the grave is the end of it all. Those people are called annihilationists. The resurrection of Jesus, though, tells us something different. The resurrection of Jesus tells us and lets us know for certain that the grave is not the end. As Americans, we don't like to talk about death. Even in the church, we don't like to talk about death. And if this is offensive to anyone, I just want to prove a point. It's the reason why we see now more and more and more funerals taking place at a funeral home, even inside of a church, because even in church, we don't like to talk about it. Yeah. But here's what we know. We use words like he passed on because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we die, the world will write dead on our obituary, but the word of God writes alive. At the cemetery holding her brother Lazarus, Jesus spoke these words to Martha in John chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Jesus throws that question in at the end there, and it throws us all for a loop. But I believe Jesus did that for a reason, because Jesus didn't do anything by accident. He did that so that some knuckleheaded preacher on April 10th, 2020, could stand here in Ellisville, Mississippi, and ask the same question. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Some shout dead, but the tomb echoes alive. But fourthly, some shout hopeless, but the tomb echoes hope. Years 1927, and the Navy has just experienced a great loss. They lose a submarine called S-4 after it collides with a Coast Guard cutter ship. Those first divers who reach that crippled sub could hear the tapping 
on the inside of the hull of that submarine. And a crew member was tapping in Morse code and he was asking the question, is there any hope? And sadly, a connection wasn't made in time and all of those sailors lost their life that day. And when we read the news or when we watch the news, we sometimes want to ask the same question. Is there any hope? Is there any hope for all this? When we look at our family problems, we look at our financial problems, we look at our physical problems, we want to tap out. Is there any hope? A person can live 40 days without food, four days without water, eight minutes without oxygen, but we cannot live a day without hope. We can't. We can't live at all. And the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope both in this life and also the life to come. The Bible says this, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. So basically what that saying is, if that's not true, what you guys have been doing here since 1886 is a waste of time. That's what it's saying. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He goes on to say, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. The first Easter discovery was made in a cemetery. I, I remember in my high school days, our home church where we grew up, always did a sunrise service. In the graveyard. And I thought, well, that's odd, right? I, first of all, I want to get up really early to go to a graveside ser or sunrise service, and then it's in the graveyard. That's kind of awkward. But the first Easter discovery was made in a cemetery. A cemetery sometimes is a place that's, that's feared, right? That's why we have horror movies that are set in cemeteries in the dead of the night, because people are just kind of wigged out on that. But the resurrection of Jesus shines like a million-watt bulb on the darkness and death, and it chases away fear. A cemetery, cemetery, not seminary, I went there too. A cemetery is often a place of sadness and tears. Over the years, I've stood beside graves of, as weeping family members said goodbye to loved ones. For some, a cemetery seems like a place like the end, a place where hope is lost. But for Christians, a cemetery is a place of hope. It's just the opposite. Paul wrote that as Christians we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Our tears are infused with the sense that death is not the end. We know that we will see Jesus and we will see our loved ones who die in the Lord. So I ask you this morning, do you have hope? The only way that you can have hope is by having a personal relationship with God through Jesus. Because we know that hope is more than blind optimism. Hope is better than bland pessimism. An optimist sees a glass half full. A pessimist sees a glass half empty. But a person with hope sees the glass as firmly held in the hands of God. You don't have to worry about the future if you know who holds the future. Now, not all scholars agree where the tomb of Jesus is located. If you've ever been to Israel, you know that there are several different traditions of where that tomb is, depending upon which tradition you grow up in. Some, I think, are just there for tourist traps, to be honest. But many reputable scholars believe the place where Jesus was buried is a place in Jerusalem called the Garden Tomb. I showed my Sunday school class this morning a picture of it so they know exactly what I'm talking about this morning. Right, guys? Right? When archaeologists uncovered this place, they determined there that there was a large garden op operating during the time of Jesus, and they, they found an, an empty tomb. And so they began searching for DNA, and scientists took samples from the tomb to determine that there were actually no human remains ever present in that tomb. And so what happens, in other words, for there to be no evidence of human DNA found there, it would mean either it was a tomb that was never used for that purpose, 
or it was a tomb that was new when Jesus was placed there. And of course, we know that his body didn't decay. The garden tomb we know is located less than 100 yards from a rock cliff that even today somewhat looks like the, the face of a, of a skull. And the Bible verifies that the tomb of Jesus was in a garden and that was very close to the place of his crucifixion. John chapter 19 verse 41 says, At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. That very first Easter morning, there was a shout. The angel says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And that shout from the, from the empty tomb has echoed back for more than two centuries. Easter isn't just a time to be quiet and meditative. It is a time to shout at the top of your lungs that Jesus is alive. William Sankster, you may have heard that name before, but he was one of England's prominent preachers during World War II. And late in his life, he suffered from progressive muscular atrophy, and he actually lost his voice. Two weeks before Sanger went to meet the Lord and be with the Lord, he woke up on Easter morning, and he, and he couldn't speak, but he, but he could still write. And he, and he wrote the words, this to his daughters, what he wrote. He says, it's terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice to shout, he is risen, exclamation point. But it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout, he is risen, exclamation point. You see, we can shout, he is alive. And maybe for some of you this morning, the want is not there. Maybe it's because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Because once you have a relationship with Jesus, you never get over it. You never get over it. It changes you forever. A natural echo may repeat a sound multiple times, but it gets fainter each time. But an echo from the tomb, it's not getting any quieter, is it? It's getting stronger and it's getting louder. And every hallelujah, and it is still echoing today. Friends, we, as followers of Jesus, we have a reason to shout. And so my prayer for you this morning, for all of us this morning, is that you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ for what he's done for you upon Calvary's cross to pay the penalty for your sin so that you can be in right relationship with God and you can live life as God intended it to be lived. That is the decision. Is your identity wrapped up in Jesus or is your identity wrapped up in yourself? In the end, you and I, on our own, will die. But in Jesus, we have hope for eternity. Father, thank you for the eternal promises of your word. God, I am grateful this morning that when the world shouts hate, God, you have demonstrated your love. May we be people who demonstrate your love. Father, this morning, when the world wants to cancel us and to cancel those around us, God, I'm grateful that because of your sacrifice on the cross, I am forgiven. Father, this morning, I am grateful for the hope that I have because of Jesus. When the world tries to rob and to steal, Lord, we know that nothing can snatch us from your hands. And Father, because of your precious gift for us on Calvary's cross, a life describes us to a T. And Father, my prayer is that everyone here, under the sound of my voice today, those who are watching us on live stream, God, that they've got a relationship with you. That the God of the universe, as the God of the universe, Lord, you have invited us into a relationship. May we walk through that door. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, as we come to our time of response this morning, I want to make a plea to you. If you're here today and 
the Lord's working on you. And that means the Holy Spirit is, is working on you this morning. And maybe he's shown you today that you don't have a relationship with me. But he's also saying, I want to know you. And today, because of what Jesus has done for us, you can have that relationship. You can know God. You can know him personally. You can know him daily. You can know him intimately. There's no more wall standing between us. It has all been torn down because of what Jesus did for us at Calvary. And the resurrection is a testimony that God has accepted that sacrifice as the only thing that can restore that relationship. Friends, that's why Easter is so important. And if you don't have that relationship, maybe God today is saying, you come. I'm going to be standing right here. I'd love to pray for you. As a church, we want to walk alongside you and, and help you in your new journey. But I want to say something to the rest of you who claim to be followers of Jesus. I do not stand up here before you. Robert doesn't stand up here before you as to say we got it all figured out. Amen. We are sinners in desperate needs of God's grace just like you are. And maybe this Easter season, as we focus on Passion Week, looking towards Easter, God is, God is speaking to you, and he's showing you some things in your life that, first of all, are in the way of your relationship with him, and maybe you need to repent of those things and sacrifice those things upon the altar this morning and walk away from them. Maybe this morning was just a reminder of God's goodness and his grace that he's shown you when you didn't deserve it, but yet he still did it through his son so that you can be in right relationship with him, that you can know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Whether it's in the pew where you're sitting, whether it's on these altars today, don't, don't quench the voice of the Lord this morning. You respond how the Lord is leading you to respond, and you, you do that in me, obediently. And as I said, I'll be right here. I'd love to pray for you this morning, whoever you are. But as we stand and sing this morning, you obey as the Lord leads. Let's stand. You respond as the Lord would lead. Man of sorrows. Man of sorrows, let my God This morning we are about to celebrate one of the most special events in the life of Christ. And we remember the Passover meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. In which he told them that this is his body and this is his blood that was shed for them. And, and to remember this until the day he, he returns. You know, scripture never tells us to remember his birth, but it does tell us to remember his death until he returns. And this remembrance is for those who have put their faith and their trust in Christ and 
And if you're here today and maybe if you're not a member of our church, we still invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper. But if you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, I would ask you to allow those elements to, to pass over this morning. Because scripture is very clear about inappropriately taking the bread and the cup in the right manner. And we want to make sure that we are obedient to the word of God. In Matthew's gospel, as we read these events taking place, the Bible tells us now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and then he blessed it. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful this morning for your body symbolized by this bread. Father, we are thankful for your body that was broken so that ours doesn't have to be. Father, we're thankful for your body that was the only sufficient sacrifice that was capable of standing in our place. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. He says now, take, eat. This is my body that was broken for you. Then the scripture tells us that he took the cup and he gave thanks for that cup. So let's pray and give thanks for the cup. Father, we are grateful this morning for the cup. Father, we know that this juice is a symbol of your blood, for your atoning blood that makes us right with you. Father, we know the scriptures tell us that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And Lord, we are grateful that your shed blood was perfect, was sufficient. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the blood that makes us white as snow. And Father, it's because of your blood we can be in right relationship with you. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. He says, and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink all of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Amen and amen. I want to say happy Palm Sunday to you. A couple things I want to remind you of as far as announcements. First of all, if you're a guest with us today, we're extremely glad that you're here. If you're sitting on the floor in the pew rack in front of you, there should be a connection card. If you're up in the balcony, they're on a table. But if you'll take that field out and take it over here to our Next Step Center out this door here, they will trade you a small gift for a filled out connection card. Other things to remind you, tomorrow from 10 to 11, we have a Seder celebration, the second, uh, Senior Adult Second Monday will be tomorrow. I want to invite you to be a part of that. Also, next Saturday, we've got our preschool Easter egg hunt along with children's disc golf from 10 to 1130 at the President's Home at Jones. And so if you have, um, if you want to go Easter egg hunting, I know Thad is really excited about Easter egg hunting next weekend. He can't wait to get there. And uh, if you're a disc golf player, bless you. Um, I don't know how to play, but I'm sure I'm going to learn how to do that. Also, we're going to have a bunch of guests on campus this, this afternoon, starting at 2 o'clock. We are hosting the Associational Bible Drill, um, I want to say challenge, event, I'm not sure what quite to call it, it's drill, that's what it's called. We're, ho we're hosting the Associational Bible Drill this afternoon, but lots of things going on in your bulletin. Uh, please pay attention and you will do well. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for a chance to gather Father, thank you that we can approach this week with hope. And God, everything this world is going to try to throw at us tomorrow and this week is going to tell us that there is no hope. But God, we know that we have hope because of Jesus. And Father, may we be ones who are ambassadors, declarers of that hope to those people that you put in front of us, that we may be faithful with the souls that you give us to faithfully proclaim the good news of Jesus, the risen Savior. And God, I pray for protection and blessing. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.